Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Old School. Uh, we wanted to get everybody ready for the NBA draft tonight by taking a ride in the DeLorean and getting ready, uh, taking taking a look at the Dr. J era Philadelphia 76ers, uh, a 10-year odyssey from worst to first. Uh, so we're going to get into it and uh, hopefully get you ready for the draft tonight. Um, I got the usual panel to my left. I got my Uncle Mark. Oh, hey, everybody. I got Rob, cousin Roger to, to the left over cousin there. Cousin Joe, how are you? How you doing? And we got a special guest, my uncle Bob. I don't know how special it is. <laughs> Bob Sullivan, a huge, <laughs> huge, really huge, huge, Sixers Hello, fan. Huge, huge Sixers fan. He's he's rocking a Matisse Stiebel jersey tonight. Uh, could be could be could be the last time you could possibly wear that. Oh, yeah, that might be the last time. time. Be gone. Yeah, Stiebel could be on the move tonight. So if he gets if he gets traded during this podcast, I reach over to grab my maxi, put my maxi on. You there might, you go. Yeah, that's the one you should have wore. No, this Probably might be the last. Be this might be the last time I can wear this. <laughs> yeah, you can sell it on eBay. You can sell it on eBay for a dollar. Yeah, yeah. Just try to mail it to Canada, Kersey's. They won't accept no. it. I'll throw in the my. I'll throw in my Wentz, my Carson Wentz jersey too, and I'll, I'll you know that's a package deal. Yeah, you, yeah. You could go to the five. You could go to the five and dime and get and get, and get rid of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, no, I mean, you know, hey, where do we begin? I mean, what what an era. I mean, you talk about, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they started off, you know, in, in uh, you know, 72, 73. I mean, the Philadelphia 76ers were like the worst team in the NBA. Um, they were coming off a trade in Wilt Chamberlain and, uh, you know, just total trash. I mean, you guys would know better than me. That was your era, but they must, they must have been trash. It's nine wins. I was, I started following the Sixers. From the day that they moved from Syracuse as the Syracuse Nationals to the Philadelphia 76ers, that was in '63. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, they had unbelievable run from the, from then on. In particular, '67, '68, even even '68 was like the uh, high point. Mm -hmm. of that, that was of the that greatest. Team. That was the highest. That was the best NBA record ever in in that time. In less than two seasons. Yeah. Talk about the process this was the first process ever because they just they got rid of everybody uh -huh. and got nobody yeah and uh by 72 73 they won they were that season they won nine games and uh i didn't get back i couldn't watch them and it took till three years later when they got george mcginnis Caldwell uh -huh. jones uh and of course the following year they got irving in 76 uh that's what really got got me back in the. In yeah, the I remember that season. It was painful. I mean, I went to one or two games, and uh, I mean, I just got smoked by everybody. I mean, they set the record at nine losses. That 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 went on up until uh, 2012 when Charlotte lost seven, and the process lost ten a couple of years ago. Yeah, they won ten. Yeah, they won ten. I'm sorry, they won mm -hmm. ten. Real real quick. The other thing that really put a damper on that added to that was the Eagles sucked. The Phillies were terrible. Mm -hmm. And for, thank God for the Flyers. Right. Yeah. Because the other three teams just were, again, that was like the original process, but all three teams, that's how bad it was. Yeah. Hey, Raj, weren't, weren't the Sixers, weren't the Sixers games 72, 73, weren't, weren't they on UHF a lot of times? Oh well, whenever they were televised, which wasn't that often. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, they were on Channel Seventeen. I think originally, originally they may have been on Forty Eight. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think because, you know, when you're yeah, like ten years old, like around ten years old, I I started really watching basketball on TV. I wasn't really fond of them, but that's my favorite team. Then was when uh, Milwaukee drafted Lou Alcindor, and then they won like in '71, I think. But they right. they won. They won like uh, when they drafted him. They increased by like thirty games in one year. Then the following year, they they won the final. So the, I started watching it. But my first Sixers year happened to be, ironically, the seventy two seventy three season when they only won nine games. That's when I started liking the Sixers. But they really sucked. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think that I think that took us down a couple times, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but who who else who else in you the history of the Sixers? Yeah, tickets were cheap. You, they, they're giving them away. Who else in the Sixers history probably started following the team that year? Just me. Ah. They had uh, 
I mean, they, the, the guy that everybody talked about was uh, Fred Mad Dog Carter. He was the gunner, you know. He got 20 points a game. And they had a guy named John Block who was their all-star representative. And he went to the all-star game. And then they mm -hmm. traded him after that for a guy named Tom Vinarsdale, who had a twin brother in the league. His name was Dick Vinarsdale, and he played for the Phoenix Suns. I met him out in uh, Scottsdale. He has an art studio there. Him and his brother, they both are artists out there. Yeah. If you, if you go out there, in fact, I th yeah, they were both there. If you go out there, you can sit and they'll, they'll talk basketball with you for hours. I mean, you know, they just hang out. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, Tom Bernarsdale originally played for the Cincinnati Royals, and then he went to the Kansas City uh, Omaha Kings. And that's where Block went. And then uh, Tom Van Arsdale came here. Dick Van Arsdale stayed in the West. But, uh, yeah, and Tom Van Arsdale was not a bad player. It's just that uh, he was a good scorer. He's, uh, he was kind of reminds me of like a Gordon Hayward type of a player, you know. Not real strong, not a good rebounder. Could shoot the outside shot. Left-handed left shooter, I believe. He's left-handed shooter. And, uh, yeah, but that, uh, that team was just – and uh there's a story um, i read i was a uh i was going to write an article for uh one of the websites on the 72 73 team and i was doing some research and they had a guy on that team his name was john hugh trap he he was a he was a bench guy from the lakers and what happened was they were in detroit on the road and that's where john q trap was from from the road I mean, uh, from Detroit. So there's, you know, he's out on the floor and the coach Ruben, Roy Rubin calls him over and says, tries to take him out of the game. And he says, I'm not getting out of the game. And he points over to right over near the basket, under the basket. One of his buddies is sitting there mm -hmm. and one of his buddies sits there and he pulls his suit jacket back and he's packing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so Roy Rubin left him in the game. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I had no respect at all from anybody on that team. He was like, he was like Rodney Dangerfield, you know. Who who was the uh, center on that uh, nine and seventy three team for the six? Because back then, I mean, you had Wilt still playing. You had Al Cinder, Willis Reed. I mean, you had some good players out there. I think West Side. So that to the shame of it is, there was a lot of good teams around that era. Oh, the uh, Knicks, the Lakers. Oh, yeah, we're some real good teams. Celtics. Uh, but our team was so bad, but we had so many good teams out there. I, who was our center on that team? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll think of it. Yeah. I know who you mean. I know who it is, too. Mm -hmm. It'll come to me. But anyway, I don't know. Yeah, that's why I'm asking because uh, everybody came to see Freddie Carter, you know, because he was the. And what's interesting is, is he had like four or five seasons where he scored 20 points a game, mm -hmm. but he never made an all star game. Never yeah, I was one. thinking I was thinking Mix was on that team, but he didn't come till later. But I always remember Mix makes. Mix came here yeah, a year later. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was and, and 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 uh, that was uh who was the guy that did the, that sat at the the dais? It was the, the that was Dave Zinkoff, right? Dave Zinkoff, and then <laughs> Carter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Carter. Carter. Carter used to make a shot. If he Carter. Yeah, right. And Mick, when Steve Mix made one, it was always be Mix. Mix. Huh. Going, yeah. back, going back, speaking of Zinkoff, going back a little bit before that, when Wally Jones played them a few years earlier, he would say, Wally, by golly. <laughs> <laughs> so I got I got I got a couple comments here. Uh my man Pat Bernard from the Gobbler Show. You can check him out on Sunday mornings at nine. Uh he says, Hey fellas, good to see you guys back. What's up, Pat? How you doing? Yeah. Uh, my man, Chris Rapizzi, he checks into the Sully squad all the time. Uh, Chris, uh, well, I'll answer, you know, Chris says, asking a current question. He says, who's the face of Phillies right now? Harper, Embiid, or Hertz? Um, I, I would say Embiid probably, but it's, it, it kind I of depends say, on the in my, in, in my opinion, if you had to put a Mount Rushmore of four guys, of the, the players, covered players today, it would be Kelsey, Harper, and Bede, and Maxi. I think they're the most popular athletes in the city. As yeah, but yeah, but if you would say five years from now, who's still going to be a, a popular, great player on his team? You might only be able to say Harper. 
because I mean, we don't know if Embiid's going to be around then, um, and all oh. these other guys. Harper's Harper's going to be around for a while. Yeah, my my, my man Paul Spencer, uh, he he does a show, uh, a, a, a two one five Cowboys uh, show on the Out of Box Network. Um, but he's he uh, he says Leroy uh, Leroy Ellis was that the guy's name seventy yeah. seventy three. Yeah, he used to play for he played for the Lakers. I believe. In fact, he was the center on the seventy three seventy four team. He was the team leader in rebounds. I just didn't put the uh, I just didn't put a lot of the stats down from the seventy two seventy three team because it was just they so suck. bad. It was just so painful. Yeah. So uh, you know. So anyway. So obviously. Um, and then it got the what? But the only benefit of it was they got the first round pick in seventy four draft, and they got Doug Collins, best player in the country. Yeah, but who? Yeah. If you if you had to go back now and look, I don't. I didn't, I never researched this. If you could take someone else besides Collins that year, was there anybody else that they should have taken, or think that was the the main guy? He said, if, if if looking back on it, was was do you think Collins was the right pick at number one, or was there anybody else that came well, he up? Was, he was a consensus. He was a consensus All American. He was on the Olympic team. Right. He was. Uh, oh yeah, he was, and he was a five or six time All Star. Um, no, uh, yeah, I remember watching was, him play. I, I mean, he had some he knee injuries. Hurt. Yeah, he had injuries with his knees and stuff, but he hurt his knee at the end, and that was it. Mm. No, no, he was a. He, Collins was a stud, you know. Yeah, I just never, I never really researched that year's draft to see who else would have been there. Yeah, so, but no, I mean, you know, let's get into this timeline here, you know, because like, like I said, I mean, we're going to get into this whole, you know, obviously we already touched on this seventy-two, seventy-three season. I mean, nine and seventy-three. I mean, this team totally sucked. Enough said. Yeah, pretty much not uh, enough said. I mean, you know, obviously Fred Mandor, Mandor Carter averaged twenty points a game. Uh, Ford by the name of John Block averaged 17.7 points per game. He was the team's only representative for the NBA All-Star game. Uh, they were awarded the first round pick in the 74 draft, which became Doug Collins. Yeah. So then we fast forward to the 73-74 season. Uh, again, they suck, 25 and 57. But, I mean, terrible season, but it is, a what, a 16-game Mark improvement. In, Mark improvement. Yeah, Mark improvement. And they brought in a new coach, Gene Shu. Yeah, G Gene Shu comes in. Uh, you know, key additions, you got Doug Collins was the number one pick in the draft, a center by the name of Harvey Catchings, and then you got Mix, Steve Mix, the mayor of Mixville. Um, Fred Carter, once again, leads the team in scoring at 21.4. Uh, Tom Van Orsdale, who you, who you touched on, he averaged 19.6. Uh, Mix is 14.9. Wow, Mix had 10 rebounds a game. Yeah. Wasn't he Wasn't he about six? How tall was Mix? Six eight. Six eight. That's it's pretty good rebounding for a guy that's six eight. Yeah, also, but, also a left hander. Yeah, not left handed. Okay. The, the, the interesting <laughs> thing is, I in today's game, guys like him couldn't play today. I don't believe a guy like Steve Mix could, could play in the NBA today. Well, well he, he certainly didn't have speed. He he had his area down in the in the block. That was it. That obviously that's that panned out. To make him a good rebounder. Yeah, he was always good. always around the basket. Even his, his shot, he had the baseline shot. It was only about eight to ten feet away, but it was money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was that's when the power forward back then was truly a power forward. It was like a six eight, six nine guy. He was burly, you know. He, he banged, you know, guys like Dave the Busher and uh, uh on the on the Portland when we played Portland they had Maurice Lucas, Maurice Lucas. Right? Lucas. I mean guys like Maurice Lucas I, I don't even think he could play today he wouldn't be able to play today and if he did he would be a backup center we need a guy like him now we What's could that? use we could use Lucas on our team yeah you know, all of a, all of a sudden with the talk of PJ Tucker uh however PJ Tucker is a much better shooter than Maurice Lucas. Well, mm -hmm. Oh, was, yeah. Lucas enough. Lucas didn't have an outside shot. All of a sudden, tough guys are. Uh, tough guys are talk of look at that, back, And then you go back into the 80s, guys like Charles Oakley. He couldn't play today. Buck Williams. Chuck Robinson. Chuck Robinson. These guys were stud power forwards. They couldn't play today. That's why, I, I mean, I'd like the game better when it's more physical. But that's just me. 
Yeah, and this, uh, my man Paul Spencer's got a comment now. Now, Hal, Hal Greer, Hal Greer isn't part of this uh, of this particular timeline, but he has an interesting question. He just wants to know uh, how was it watching Hal Greer, Greer in his prime prior to, prior to the seventies, late in his career. Only heard stories from my dad. How was how was it watching Hal Greer? In, in uh, Hal Greer was he was lights out. He was tremendous. Hall of Fame player. He, mm -hmm. he was a tremendous shooter. He's, He's a great, great shooter, player. Great point guard. Uh, he was strong. Yeah. He could uh, rebound. I he mean, he, probably, was, and he, he could defend. There was nothing he could not do. Then teams used to put the best defensive guards on him. Like whenever they would go and play Chicago, they would put Jerry Sloan on him. Guy Jerry Sloan eventually became the coach of the Utah Jazz, the right. team that lost to the Chicago Bulls. Well, Jerry Sloan was always first team all NBA defense. He was always even one of the, the toughest guys in the league. And whenever Greer played Chicago, I mean, he, that's what his assignment was. And all the all the teams that had great defenders played played uh, played Greer because that's how that's how that's how great he was. Kind of kind of a quirky uh, thing with Hal Greer. At least in my recollection, he's the only player that I ever saw when he shot a foul shot. He shot a jump shot. Yeah, yeah. I heard that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I've never during that time or. After that time, I I've never seen a player actually literally take a jump shot, and he was pop, I'm guessing he 80%, was 80 percent, 75, 80 percent. He was easy. He was certainly I have close to 80 percent. Yeah, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but I remember he was. I mean, it was almost like if he went to the line, you didn't really have to worry it. You didn't have to sweat it. He, he was he was a great player. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, so obviously, obviously, we're working our way down this timeline here. So. You know, 73, 74, they improve a little bit. Uh, they get to 25 wins. Here's here's where you got Gene Shu as the coach. So now we get to 74, 75. Uh, they have another improvement. They improved to 34 and 48. They're fourth in the NBA Atlantic Division. Uh, they got a new assistant coach by the name of Jack McMahon. And I'm, he was he, he was a real popular assistant from what I remember, correct? That, yeah, that <laughs> In, in 74, 75, getting Jack McMahon. And getting Pat Williams that year. And Pat That's Williams, but specifically Jack McMahon, because Jack McMahon evolved into it. He, he was the uh, scout or trade trade maker, uh, in addition to Pat Williams, obviously. But mm -hmm. Jack McMahon, as a scout, was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And all the you, – you'll notice when we advance the calendar and go into the subsequent uh, seasons – his decisions all panned out just about. Well, yeah, that's 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 what that's what I was wondering because I mean, like Maurice Cheeks wasn't a high draft pick. The Boston second Str round pick, right? Boston Strangler, Andrew Tony, Southwest Louisiana State, right? Franklin right. Franklin Edwards, Frank, he Franklin was a role Ed player, but right? Yeah. I mean, he he found guys, you know. I mean, I mean, obviously anybody, you know, Ray Charles could have found Dr. J. You know Trading what I mean? George, Everybody knew Dr. J. Trading right? George McGinnis to get Bobby Jones. I yeah. mean, I could go on and on. He now, did. was that George McGinnis was a hell of a scorer? So when they made that trade for Bobby Jones, was that was that criticized here? Uh, I think it just raised an eyebrow too. But Bobby Jones was well established. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a total reversal in philosophy from McGinnis, who rebounded, did not play great defense no and he had a he had a uh foul he yeah he, a lot of fouls he had he was lukewarm with the organization for for whatever reasons uh and he wasn't really great in the playoffs good. was he i don't remember him being great in the playoffs he wasn't that bad bob but he wasn't he you know it's not like he scored eight to ten points more in the in the postseason than he did in the preseason um but when they it was Billy Cunningham's ur urging to make that deal for Bobby Jones. Yeah. And clearly that McGinnis went off to nowhere. Like he, he went back, I think he went back to the Pacers, as I remember. He went to Denver and then he got hurt, I think. And then he went to the Pacers. That's where he ended his career. Right. And, uh, you know, that that's as much as you can In say. Fact, I think, I think we, I think he faced, we faced the Pacers later. When I was researching, and uh, he was on that team when when we uh, we played the Pacers. We played the Pacers a couple, couple times, times yeah. and we always had our way with them. That, mm -hmm. We were when we were winning, 
uh, again, from 75, 76 on, we, we, it was always a first round uh, matchup between us and the Pacers. And that's because the Pacers just made the playoffs. And the other thing was it was a best of five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, we, we had no problem dispatching uh, the Pacers in the playoffs. Yeah. So, so anyway, so now we're in this, we're in, we're in the 74, 75 season. They win 34 games. Uh, they had one NBA, they had one NBA all-star, which was Steve Mix. Uh, key off-season addition was small forward Billy Cunningham. Yeah, he came back from the ABA. How come? I what I don't understand. How come Fred Carter leads the leads the team in scoring every year, but he never makes the All-Star team? What was just, that? What was that all about? That's just the way it was. Well, you had you still had a uh, if I'm not mistaken, you still had Oscar Robertson. Oh yeah, you playing, got, and you had some you had some good guards. Earl Monroe. Earl Monroe. Walt Frazier. Walt Frazier. So it was just a lot. Uh, Jerry West. Uh, then you had uh, yeah. you had uh, Boston had like JoJo White. Those types of guys, yeah, it was um, it was just a lot of talent. Maybe JoJo White was a little bit later, but I mean, they had there was just there was just the there was just the talent. Like I remember there was only there wasn't as many teams as today, right? So the talent pool was today is really thin. Okay, I mean, back then, I mean, it wasn't as many. It's teams. Not to say Carter didn't deserve an appearance, mm-hmm. but it, it, you know, well, it, and the, it, and the, and the team wasn't really good enough either. So I mean, if it's if all things are equal, right. they're going to they're yeah. going to take uh, you know they're going to take the guy from the you know the Knicks at the time or you know a team that's better Celtics. than the Celtics. Earl Monroe. Or, Earl Monroe. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so now we're you know now now the the, the following year uh, they start to really make some hay. They go forty six and thirty six. They finish second in the NBA Atlantic. Uh, uh, with key off season, now they make a lot of good. Here's where they made some really good off season additions. They got Dar- uh, Caldwell Jones as a free agent, Daryl Dawkins. Um, I always think of him breaking, uh, uh, smashing the backboards. That's what I think of with Daryl Dawkins. Chocolate Thunder. Yeah, uh, World Be Free. Those two guys were drafted, and then they got Bryant. Uh, he was drafted by the Warriors, and then they brought him in, and they signed McGinnis as a free agent, and. Uh, yeah, Nick they, they, was a big signing. That was a big signing that, back time. then. Yeah, he had a good season. Yeah, that, was a, that was an exciting time when, when we got McGinnis. I remember Dad, we used to go down to quite a few games when McGinnis was there. That was exciting. Yeah. And, I, I was at that playoff game uh, the following season when they lost to Buffalo. Uh, but I was at that – I remember being at that playoff game. I think I was at game three when they lost it. Yeah, so we look into some of these – you know, obviously the season leaders here. Here now, now Doug Doug Collins looks like he's stepping into his own. Well, Doug Collins averages twenty point eight points per game. You got Mc, McGinnis was twenty three and twelve point six rebounds. Uh, Mix is thirteen point nine and eight point two boards. Carter still averages eighteen point nine, and uh, Billy C. Billy Cunningham thirteen thirteen point seven. Point seven rebounds, five point four assists. Er, injured during the season he and t- retired as a player, so he was done as a player at this he point. He tore his knee up. Yeah, he ripped his knee up big time. I mean, he mm-hmm. probably could have. Today he would have been back playing, but I mean, they had a front. They had the picture was on the Inquirer. There's a front page picture on the Inquirer that were seventy five. The Bulletin was still around. Maybe mm-hmm. it was the Bulletin, probably both. And uh, they show him underneath, under the court under the basket he's holding his knee he's writhing in pain writhing in pain and that's really a, you know so he ripped himself out but another thing what's interesting like my nephew just joe just said you look at some of those off additions i mean aside from mcginnis you had caldwell jones Darrell dawkins free and then bryant i mean all those guys were on the 76 team and they traded dawkins they traded for free and uh Traded Joe Bryant. They traded Joe Bryant down the road, and Joe Bryant, Joe Bryant trade, uh, got them. What did I say? Was it was it Barkley? Yeah. Was it Barkley? Caldwell got it? us Mo- Caldwell was in the Moses I deal, right? It remember. It was, I, think Caldwell, Caldwell, I think Caldwell Jones was in the Moses Malone deal. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Free Free was ultimately traded to the San Diego uh, Clippers for for for. Uh, for that pick and then we picked Barkley and then later um 
Joe Bryant, um, Joe Bryant was traded to the uh, Clippers, and that pick was was uh, we used that, and that would have been Brad Dari. So I mean, you know, these are these are very good moves that these this you know Pat Williams and Jack McMahon. Jack McMahon and Billy Cunningham are making for this team. And Louis, Louis Free or World Be Free, whatever you want to name him, uh, he also got he, he was in turn traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah, and he had a he was a big star in Cleveland. Yeah, he was the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was a good great shooter, great shooter. You know. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I I wore I I got a Joe Bryant Sixers jersey. So one day, one day last year, I'm 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 doing a uh, DoorDash and I walk in and these two guys are standing out there. They're like, "Oh man, you got a Joe Bryant jersey?" I'm like, "Yeah, man." I'm like, "I take it back." And then they were like, "Man, that's old school." And I'm like, "Hey, man." I'm like, "Not only was he a decent player, I was like, but Kobe came out that man's balls." And they're like, "Oh shit." Yeah. <laughs> but um. Now, nah, so you know, so we get we get in the '76 NBA playoffs here. Uh, like you guys touched on a little bit, they played the Buffalo Braves. Um, they, uh, looks like Freddie Carter averaged 28 points a game. McGinnis 23, Collins 19.3. Mix. I mean, the Sixers had some really balanced scoring. I mean, that was all that was. Uh, but the the uh, Buffalo Braves had Bob McAdoo, and uh, McAdoo was. You know what was McAdoo? Um, ahead of his time, as far as like what you would call like a like a uh, like a stretch a stretch type center, because McAdoo could really shoot from the outside, correct? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, no, yeah. He, could, he could play. He, he could play, play today. He, could still play today. He, he was like a stretch power forward. Yes, McAdoo was like six nine, six ten. Uh, think of a think of Durant today, but stronger. And a better rebounder. A oh, much better rebounder. Yeah. Much better yeah, rebounder. In fact, if I had to take, in fact, if I had to take McAdoo in his prime against Durant in his prime, I would take McAdoo every time. Think I of, think of, think of today's really? game. Think of get today's teams with the lack of centers out there. McAdoo would play great today. Yeah, he he would have been, he would have absolutely had a three point shot. Oh, McAdoo could yeah. do anything. Yeah. Well, I remember. Um, I remember this was late in his career, and I, you know, obviously, I was too young for the '82, '83 season, but I watched it on tape because Grandpa had it uh, on the on the video cassette. But I remember McAdoo played a role with the Lakers on that '83 team, and he and he was hitting jumpers then. Oh yeah, he was one of. The, they called him the Magnificent Seven of the, those early '80s teams. It was uh, Showtime. They, yeah, Showtime. You know, it was Kareem and Magic and Wilkes, Wilkes Nixon. Uh, Rambis, McAdoo, and the seventh guy was it was it was guard. Yeah, uh, uh, Cooper. You, you say Cooper? A uh, Cooper. Cooper was the seventh guy. Right. That was the they, they, the the L.A. sports writers they termed them the, the the magnificent seven. So that's what that's what they were referred to all the time because they were they were they were tremendous, and he was one of them, and he's you know and he had. You know, his, he was, his peak years were behind him, but he was still contributing. He, he killed us in the playoffs. Oh, he, he killed us. Yeah, I mean, this. you look at this, this 76 series when we played them in the playoffs. Hmm. Game one, McAdoo, 36 points, 23 rebounds. Mm -hmm. Now, the second game. They probably had George McGinnis cover him. Yeah, exactly. Game three, which is the key game at the Spectrum, we lost that in overtime by one game. McAdoo, thirty-four points, twenty-two rebounds. Now you, you now if, that's what I'm saying. If you, if I would, in my view, if, and I don't know what you think, Colonel, or what you think, Raj, but I would take Jack do before I take Durant anytime, because that's just he, he was just so much more physical. He was stronger, and he could rebound better. Cobb's a tremendous rebounder. It was a more complete, even you know. I think back then guys had to be more complete players in a lot of ways. Now you can be much more specialized. I think McAdoo was the top one of the top seventy-five, wasn't he? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. deservingly so. Right. Yeah. Well, if you're comparing him to Kevin Durant, then he must have been. That's what I player. think of. I mean, I mean, that's what comes to mind. But a rebounder. But a better rebounder. He's stronger, and it's like I said, I would. That's who I would. If I, if somebody said, yeah, you could have your choice in their prime, I would take McAdoo every time. 
think uh, my man Sean Kilrain with the question right here. Uh, he goes, "What's up, guys? Who do you guys? Who did you guys enjoy watching the most when you watched the Sixers?" I'll, 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 during this period, uh, I guess both. Either during this period oh, or irregardless, <laughs> nothing compares to with me, Irving. Yeah. Okay. Dr. J was, he was a, it was just, uh, it was a human highlight film all the time. You would go to, we would go to a bar and watch the Sixers. And if they were on the road, you would, we would go to Jersey and watch them because it was on prison because they didn't, didn't have, uh, couldn't get cable in the city. And then, you know, with them, so all the playoff games, we would always go to Jersey and watch them. And <clears> he, <throat> he would do things that were just <clears throat> mind blowing. I also <clears throat> was a big fan of, uh, Tony when he started really lighting it up. I mean, it was like about 1980 yeah 81 he was a he was really tremendous player well guess. for me for me like Ron irving's the obvious but when joey brought up how he felt about mcginnis i mean i like mcginnis when he was here but then when we traded him for bobby jones you're like all right what's the expectations you know and all of a sudden Bob, the reason the city didn't get up in an uproar because bobby jones came in instantaneously you saw his value and not only on defense but I mean, you know, he would strip, he could strip the ball. He'd run down court, you know, slam dunk it. I mean, he was, he, he played good offense too. I mean, I liked watching him play because. Uh, he pro- Bob, he probably averaged, I'm guessing 15, 16 points a game. Yeah. With, and when you factor in and he was a good rebounder, uh, he was terrific on the break. Yeah. yeah. He, he ran the break better. He, than- fin- he was a good finisher. He was just a, he's just a great player. I was yeah, a, yeah. uh, I had a uh, the day of the, the day of the Super Bowl, 1980, uh, 81. That, that was the because I had uh, tickets right down on the floor for the Phoenix Suns. I Me and a couple of the guys I grew up with, we went down there, and it was at the end of the game, and the Sixers were up by one, and the guy goes to impound the pass down at the end where Phoenix was going to be <laughs> shooting. He had like still he had enough time he had enough time to get a he had enough time mm-hmm. to get a shot off. Bobby Jones jumps in front of the pass, and you see him in the air, and he's going in the air, and he's out of bounds, and he passes the ball back to I forget it was either Cheeks or or, or, or Dr. J or whatever. And then he saved the game. That was yeah. one of the greatest defensive players I ever saw. I mean, it was just amazing. Did, and that place went ape shit. Did, you know? did, didn't you say in your notes they call him the Secretary of Defense? He was known as the Secretary of Defense. He was on. He was the first team NBA all defensive team and the ABA too. So he Joe, made, when, uh, so Joe, when he came in, you forgot all about McGinnis. Trust me. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, exactly. I, you did. You did that. You did. You did. Yeah, what George McGinnis? Who's that? Yeah, it was it? Yeah. So let me get let me get to a few comments here before we move on because I'm gonna uh my man Mike Lauro, you could check him out on the Gobbler Show at nine o'clock on Sundays, and also he does a show at eight o'clock tonight um on the Out of Box Network called the uh the uh, the Locker Room. It's really good. He touches on all four sports. Um, his was the Boston Strangler. He's like a Boston Strangler, Andrew Tony. Uh, my man Dave Yarnell, he's on uh, Patterson Avenue Fanatics. He's, he, I guess maybe he was a Lakers fan. I'm not sure, but he liked Kurt Rambis. I, I always liked Kurt, aka Clark Kent. I, he was, yeah. Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Rambis was a very recognizable guy right there. And we had <laughs> Mark Ivor Brody to go up against Rambis. <laughs> they served the same kind of purpose. They played yeah. 20 minutes a game. They just banged. They were power forwards. They just <laughs> boxed out, committed fouls. Both both could never couldn't be in this league today, unfortunately. Yeah. But they both hustled their they both hustled their ass off. And then I got two questions here. The first is from Pat Bernard. He says, Who was your favorite Sixers coach in the seventies and eighties? I mean, I, I I was a little young, but I would imagine it would have to be Billy Cunningham considering they won the championship yeah. with them. Hands hands down. Yeah. First, first of all, Billy Cunningham was an icon when he played here. Uh it was a there was when he came back for when he came back in 74, 75 from playing the ABA for a couple of years, uh, that was big time. Yeah. People were, you know, he was just a fan favorite. And uh, when he took over for Gene Shue, um, and not just start, he was so big here and he was such a great player. And all the guys in the league knew how great a player he was because they all played against him. He had such instant credibility coming into that mm-hmm. locker room. 
that if he said, hey, you're doing this wrong, you're that wrong. I mean, I can remember games, and I'm sure you remember too, Raj, and Carol, you probably remember when Andrew Tony, he would ride Andrew Tony those first couple of years. He would see him call him over, Andrew, Andrew. Uh, and he was always chewing it out or something, but he made him a great player. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, yeah, and I mean, Andrew Tony, I mean, uh, you know, he was such a great player. I mean, the Boston Celtics had to go out and get Dennis Johnson just to try to right. slow him down. Yeah. And that's how good Andrew Tony was, you know. And the Sixers <laughs> tried. In, 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 our, in our silly effort after the championship season or a year after that, we we trade uh, Doherty to Cleveland to get Roy Henson to go up against Kevin McHale. Look how that worked out, yeah. you know? Didn't quite work out the same. And I, I got I just want to touch on this real quick because obvi obviously we're doing the uh, the, the Sixers, the uh, old school Dr. J ever, but I have, I have a, we have a modern day question from uh, Jeremiah Put Putman. Uh, he says, what's our thoughts on Kyrie Irving having the Sixers on his list of trade destinations? Um, I, I'll answer first. I don't I don't really think anything of it because I don't I, I mean, obviously, Kyrie's a great player, but he's where him, I, him and Maxi couldn't play on the court at the same time. You'd be too small. So I don't I don't see us being a factor. I think if he goes anywhere, it'd probably be Lakers or Miami or, or one of the other teams. Colonel, what do you think? <laughs> well. I don't know how this guy never shows up to play. He doesn't play enough games. I mean, if, if, if oh, you knew I he was good. I mean, I, I agree with Stephen A. Smith. I mean, if you look at this guy, I mean, he is a great player, but how do you count on him? Exactly. That's my, that's my problem. It, it, it's risk with a capital R. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he, he marches through his own tunes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a terrific ball player nobody can take that away from him. i think it was last year in the beginning of the season he took off like five games because he just he just didn't even show up to practice family birthdays and yeah or something he just didn't he's an yeah, it's not all it's not always COVID. and you know we just talked about uh, bobby jones and now you're talking about this guy i mean yeah, I'd rather have Bobby. I'd rather well, have bobby jones that, today exactly. and, you know today, 70 well, years well, old or whatever he is that. and i kyrie I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much money down that he would end up with the Sixers. and We wouldn't I, have the money to pay him, firstly. <laughs> Secondly, that would be so combustible with him and uh, Harden together. I don't see how that possibly could work because it didn't work <laughs> in Brooklyn. I, I think that's more likely to be agent speak. Yeah, yeah that's what I think. And uh, I'll tell you, I would, if, if we had the opportunity, if, 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 it, if it were to develop, it, you, he's so good. You would start to say, "Geez, can we can we make this work?" <laughs> you bite your you be biting your tongue every game to see if he's going to play or he's not going to play, or you know. I yeah. would rather him leave and go somewhere else, and then get Durant all pissed off, and then give up whatever it took to get Durant and just go forward with Durant and Embiid and put a bunch of role players around him. I'd be surprised. If you know what I mean? I'd rather do that. I'd be surprised if the Lakers are maybe his. First choice, even though he would be back with an old uh, foe, former teammate, LeBron. Mm -hmm. But uh, as of today, there's no doubt who's the better player. And Irving is oh, yeah. is the better player than LeBron, not to take anything away from his career. But, Maybe uh, what they should do is con con uh, yeah. try to look up where Bob McAdoo is and get in there. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I'd rather have Bob McAdoo. You know he'd be playing his ass off, even though he's like in his – 60s it's, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how that nets saga plays out starting tonight it, it's going to be fascinating yeah but uh danny frick katoni Tacony fellas uh some of the guys maybe i i guess you're referring to Devereaux sports yeah some of the guys uh pat bernard they grew up on Devereaux Devereaux street and uh my yes, uncle go, my uncle used to have a house right off of Devereaux. Um, but let's let's get back to our let's get back to our timeline here because um, yeah. you know now we're now we're entering the 76 77 season and uh, this is where here comes Dr. J. So I can imagine I mean this this must have been this was the city at a fever pitch when they when they when they oh, got the doc. Yeah. Well, yeah, for a couple of reasons they were coming off particularly the year before a really successful year for them. Uh -huh. Yeah, and. Uh, it, 
was like it was like the 75 76 Phillies with Dave mm-hmm. Cash it was that type of there was a lot of a lot of good vibe coming from the city uh because they were a better team and they had gotten McGinnis the year before and Caldwell Jones and uh Darryl, oh, Darryl, Darryl Dawkins mm-hmm. yeah. uh and I'll be honest with you I didn't know that much about Irving uh when he came to Philadelphia uh because with the ABA obviously the league collapsed but prior two or three years the last two or three years of the ABA they didn't have a television contract mm-hmm. and yeah you just it was tough it was tough to be visible be visible to uh cities that had an NBA and there was a real rift between the NBA and the ABA mm-hmm. all that goes with it but I'll tell you what I remember that first game and he carried his little, his little doctor bag and uh <laughs> it didn't take long to realize he was the real deal and he was the man and uh, it was six years uh six million dollar contract right which was the yeah highest he was the time. six million dollar man because that's when the tv show came on yeah well yeah uh, yeah no and he wore the number six yeah right we, we made a deal part of the deal was the, the new new jersey team uh the nets um were broke yeah and they they desperately needed money and uh we we, we bought him for six million dollars right and then he was also making at the time six hundred thousand dollars a year was his initial salary and uh god can you imagine if he was playing today he'd be making 50 million a year oh yeah he'd be making more he'd be making more at, at his peak he'd be making more than hard he'd be and, making and, more than westbrook and, and in fact in fact i mean from one of the things I, you guys would know better than me obviously um but one of the things i remember was the nba was really hurting in the 70s i mean like like for instance i've seen many times that the uh the game six of the uh of the the game where magic jumped center which we'll touch on in a little bit uh that wasn't even televised live like can you imagine an nba finals game not tele on tape delay and well, joey and, and, the uh <laughs> we would go to games with irving and all down there but you would think with that team <laughs> It, you couldn't get tickets. You could always get tickets there, and it wasn't always a sellout. And that blows my mind when you have the team they had. You know? Yeah, that's true. They always that was the one thing. And back in that era, flyers always sold out. But it seems like Sixers, you could never get a sellout a lot wow. of times. We could always go down to a game unless it was you know unless it was certain game teams like Boston, yeah. Lakers came in. But if it was yeah. like they were playing. They back, really- they really started highlighting the opponents because uh, I know from going down there, uh, they would give the upcoming games and you mm-hmm. know, don't miss the Houston Rockets with Moses Malone. Yeah, and this you know Malone came out of high school into the yeah. NBA, and Houston was just back you know in seventy six ish or seventy seven, uh, Houston was just only in the NBA for a couple mm-hmm. of years. Yeah, but you got to see all these ABA. Uh, players and uh the one the one thing that stands out when i when i first think of when irving first got on the team he was the only player i ever saw that when he got the ball there was the place literally didn't stand up wow in expectation i compared it to the flyers with uh, rick mcleish who was a great yeah. great offensive mm-hmm. well tell him what that tell 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 Talk about that Cedric Maxwell scenario you read you were telling me about. Oh, on the real quick on the uh, Dr. J biography that was on the, the MEA channel. I think that was about four or five years ago or so. Uh, it was it was they had all obviously the, the opposing players interviews and stuff like that. And Cedric Maxwell, who turned out to be uh, a good friend of Irving's, which I never knew till I watched the biography, but his comment was the first time. The Celtics came in to play Philadelphia after Irving was signed. Irving made one of his patent moves, intercepted a pass, and he took like two dribbles. Uh-huh. And Cedric Maxwell said, all of a sudden the place was standing and screaming. And he says, I only know one thing, something bad's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is – uh. You know, so obviously, so this is the start of the of the Dr. J run. I mean, so 76, 77, Sixers win the Atlantic. They win, they win 50 and 32. Uh, 
you know, key, key off-season additions. Obviously, we have Dr. J. Uh, they also got point guard by the name of Henry Bibby from the New Orleans Jazz. Uh, most talented team in the league. Uh, three NBA All-Stars. You had Dr. J. You had McGinnis. You had Collins. <coughs> uh, Julius Irving, 21.6 points. McGinnis, 21.4. Doug Collins, 18.3. Uh, in the seven in the 77 playoffs, they won the Eastern Conference semifinals four games to three versus Boston. Uh, Doug Collins, Doug, Doug Collins and Dr. J each averaged 24 points in the playoffs. Uh, or I guess the uh, Celtics had White and Havlicek with tw- Havlicek Joe with Joe 20. White, John Havlicek. Yeah, with 20. Dave Cowens. Mm. Uh, Sixers won the Eastern Conference finals four games to two versus the Houston Rockets. How the hell did that happen? Well, Houston was in the East back then. Back then. That's like, weird. like Dallas Cowboys yeah. are in the East with, yeah. you know, in football. And Malone, at that point, Moses Malone is what, 18 years old? 19 years old? In what year? 76, 77. Within 2021 20, years old. 2021 20, years old. He was born in 56. He, uh, he, he averaged 18 points a game and 17.2 rebounds a game against us in that Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, well, that, one there's, one there's, thing to add with regard to the Sixers in that 76-77 season, uh, CBS had the uh, NBA contract, and they always had uh, games. Their their main day was on Sunday, mm-hmm. and I don't know how many games we were televised, mm-hmm. but it was like mm-hmm. almost every week we were one of the Sunday games. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were the we were Showtime before Showtime. Mm-hmm. Because of the doctor, right? Brett Mox and by Musburger, and, and we used to say that here comes the doctor. That that saying right there, that was Brett Musburger. Here comes the doctor, especially when he when he would steal the when he would steal the ball and he would he would you'd be going down to, to for a jam. Well, here well here's here's a question by Pat Bernard. He says how much how much of a one man wrecking crew was Doctor J? Uh, I mean, but it he, looked like the team was really good though too. So the team was tremendous and. And at the time, being coached by Gene Shue, uh, he did not. They, they were hesitant. They they had the feeling that if they turned him loose the way he was in the ABA, it would set McGinnis mm-hmm. off. Well, hindsight, uh-huh. you say Good, goodbye, George. Yeah, Irving could have scored 30, 35 mm-hmm. points a game. Yeah, there was a there was a there was some ego type thing between those two guys. Big, not as much Dr. J mm-hmm. but McGinnis. McGinnis knew how great Irving was, but I mean, I think it was just a lot of jealousy on his part. Well, a, cre- a credit to Irving is he was the he was a gentleman. He was guy. the gentleman. He was the diplomat. Yeah. And the coach asked him to do something. He says, <clears throat> "Okay." I've seen him interviewed recently, and it may have been in his biography, uh, where he really, when he was in the playoffs, uh, he really took offense to being controlled by Gene Shue. Gotcha. But. Yeah. So we, so, you know, so, so here we make that, here we play in the NBA finals versus the Bill Walton led Portland trailblazers. Um, Sixers were the favorites in that series. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what I, what I remember just from hearing stories was uh, Sixers were up two games to none. Um, unfortunately, Portland came back and won four in a row. Uh, some memorable, you know, Dr. J averaged 30 points, Doug Collins, 20. Portland, Portland was like a really well balanced team. I mean, you had Bill Walton. That's a shame Bill Walton had to get hurt because he was such a great player. And don't don't <laughs> overlook Jack Ramsey as the head coach. Yeah, yeah. So so Bill Bill Walton averages 18, 18 and a half, 19.7 rebounds. Uh, Maurice Lucas, 19.7 and 11. So what I'm gathering from this, I mean, you guys saw the series, I didn't, but um did port portland must have dominated the boards because it looked like they were much bigger than the sixers yeah well walton was just he was just so intimidating yeah two totally different teams Mm -hmm. uh and excuse me the 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 impetus of the turnaround we we won the first two games in philadelphia rather easily Mm -hmm. and uh once it went out to portland coming off of the second i guess it was Trying to think of the uh, was it the second game of the, the fight? It's game two, and the spectrum game. was the fight between Dawkins and that was a that was a turnaround in the series after that fight. What what Doug Collins commented on it retrospectively with that game, he said that fight 
uh, pulled Portland to, together and it pulled us apart. Yeah. Uh, that was his that was his comments. But so that was the turning point. Well, well I think I think I remember hearing like Dawkins was upset, too, because he didn't think the team had his back. But if Dawkins could have just concentrated more just on rebounds that series, he kind of, uh, you know, I think he kind of uh, went on the back burner after that fight. Yeah, and, he, and, and Bob, he was never known as a real rebounder. He was a no, but he had the specimen. size to be. Yeah, yeah, a physical specimen, uh, pretty good handling the ball, surprisingly, mm -hmm. uh, his dunks, etc. Um, but he was not the easiest guy to coach. Mm -hmm. and, and and Shoe had <laughs> Shoe was from the old school. Shoe had played. In the 50s and early 60s, he was a five or six time all star. So he was like, uh, he came from like, you know, it'd be the equivalent of like a guy that that played in the 70s that was playing for a Lombardi type, mm -hmm. you know, or a Mike Ditka, you know, like the old school type guys, you know, didn't, you know. And the other, but I see, yeah. I, I blame, I blame coaching in that whole season. I mean, they should have made him with his size, we didn't need him to be a scorer. They should have played him more. And Joey hit it on the head. They, those guys pretty much out rebounded us out, out physical. They were oh, more, I, out, more physical. I think they tried they but should, again. He, he was not really receptive to once he got out on the court, they, they were, and, and he, he even commented on it. I've seen him interview uh, interviews from him. And he said, when, whenever you got the, on the court with that team, Everybody that got the ball wanted to shoot, mm -hmm. right? Or, yeah. or or score before the finals. We had scorers. We didn't before need the finals that year. On uh, ABC World News Tonight, they had you know back then there was a guy named Dick Shap. He has a son named Jeremy Shap, who does sports for ESPN and stuff. But Dick Shap was one of the. He was a big time sports writer From and, and sports broadcaster back in the seventies. I mean, he was one of the top guys. And uh, they did a feature on the Sixers, and he's, he called it the greatest, the greatest team ever assembled, as far as talent wise. And they were, they had everything. You look at mm -hmm. shooting, rebounding, mm -hmm. defense. I mean, they were just they had it all. Right. Should have definitely. That, that's why they they should have won that championship. So and it, and it came. And the thing that was, what Rod was talking about with with Gene Shue controlling Irving, in Game Six at Portland, Irving scored forty points in that game. But anyway, McGinnis got the last shot. He McGinnis took the last shot in the game. He used to have this push shot. One hand, yeah, he would one hand like push this. shot, and he came up and it, yeah, and he, and he and it came up short. And I remember I watched that game with my father, and I can remember my father got up after he missed that shot, and we lost. And he walked over to the front door, and it's the only time I had ever thought. He, my father was going to start crying. He looked like he was just about to start crying. That's how, you know, because I mean, he was a diehard. We all were. And uh, I mean, why is why is McGinnis taking the last shot when Irving was Irving was hot? They couldn't, they couldn't stop him. Yeah. And the, the other the other thing about real quickly about Dawkins, uh, what killed his career basically, invariably he was always in foul trouble. Mm -hmm. So. He, no, he didn't have the benefit of playing I mean, a lot that's a scanner. per game. Gotcha. So, so here, here, here we get. So this is where this this is where the Sixers have the saying where Dr. J goes, "We owe you one. We owe you one." So yeah, yeah um, they had a they had a, they featured a commercial that fall, at least before the next season. Before the next season, and they showed him in the locker room, and he closes the locker. And he looks at nearly like he looks at the camera and he's there. We owe you one. Then it's pause. We owe you one. Ah. It was great. And everybody, everybody, anybody that was alive back then, remember there was a Sixers fan would remember that. Yeah, un unfortunately, that turned into a, a real issue with them because the following, you know, we're, it was another six years before they got to actually be number one. Yeah. And they, they had a hard time living that. That yeah, advertising. Yeah, yeah. So let, really did. Yeah, so let, let's fast forward a little bit here. So the next year, the next season, they they again win fifty five games. They finish first in the Atlantic. 
Uh, but unfortunately, they don't make it back to the finals. They lose to the Washington Bullets, the uh, Elvin Hayes, Wes Unsell Washington Bullets, who yeah, would man. who would who would eventually become the NBA champions. They beat the Seattle Supersonics uh, in the NBA finals. So the Sixers didn't get back in 78. Uh, 79, 78, 79, it looks like they kind of, they take a step back. Um, uh, Billy McGi- uh, Billy Billy Cunningham is the coach. Um, and here's Chuck Daly becomes an assistant, it looks like, at yeah. this point. Uh, yeah. So Chuck Daly hops on as an assistant, future Hall of Famer. Uh, the 78, 79 team. This is when they trade McGinnis for Bobby Jones. Okay. And they draft Maurice Cheeks. So you can see they're still putting the building blocks together. Yeah, you know, I see that. Okay. You know, Jack, uh, Jack, uh, Jack McMahon and Pat Williams, right? Look at the players. Look how they turned out. You know, Chiefs is their all-time yeah. uh, point guard. Hall of Famer. And uh, he started his rookie year. Yeah. Never said a word. It was totally intimidated by the by the whole experience of coming into the NBA and then being in charge of the team. But once you, once you got on the court. Yeah. He, he came from, I believe it was what, uh, Southwest Texas. Does that sound about right? Something like that. Yeah, it was something like that. But yeah, um, Southwest <laughs> Texas State or something. I mean, he was a real small school. Tony came from Alcorn State. Yeah, Tony came from Alcorn State. Oh, okay. So here, 79 playoffs. Again, I, uh, and another thing <clears throat> that was important, too, was that was the year they traded World Beat Free to the 1984 okay. first round pick. And that ultimately became James uh, Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley. So again, Mc, uh, McMahon and Billy Cunningham and Pat Williams. I mean, they these were guys, making some great moves. They were making amazing moves every year. And they had some real dunces in in, in, in running the other teams too. Um, yeah, but they knew how to leverage. Well, here, that. well, this this kind of touches on what we're talking about. Pat Bernard has a question. He says, "Who was the who were the most underrated picks in the 70s and 80s? I mean, you could say either Maurice Cheeks or Andrew Tony, honestly, probably, right? Considering right. where they were oh, yeah. at. I'm sure. You know, e- either one of those guys. And, um, you know, so here we go. They, uh, unfortunately, in 79, they only made the Eastern Conference semifinals. They lost three, they lost in seven games to the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, the Iceman, George Gervin, beat them. And uh, the Seattle Supersonics would win the championship that year. Yeah, they beat the bullets, so it was like a switch. They were both good teams, Sioux, Seattle, and, I, and I, Washington. I went to uh, a playoff game with the Spurs and yeah. the Sixers. And obviously, this, the teams from Texas must have been considered in the East because how would we face them in the playoffs other than being right? The uh, so uh, when they added teams, they clearly they realigned. Yeah, well, it was after the ABA NBA merge, which said they were just. You know, there was, there was like a, it wasn't done right as well. It wasn't done as after. Then they started expanding even further, and they did better geographical divisions and things. Right. Yeah. So here, so here, here we enter the decade of the eighties, uh, seventy nine eighty season. And in the decade of the eighties, the early eighties, the Sixers make the finals three, uh, three of the first, yeah, three of the first four years they make the NBA finals. And the one year they didn't make it. I was uh, I was always told that was the year we would have won the championship because that was the year the Houston beat the Lakers. 80, 81. And right. That, that and that was that was when eighty one the Sixers blew a three games to one lead to the Celtics. Right. And the Celtics wound up winning the championship. That was Larry Bird's first championship. Yeah. But it should have been the Sixers. Definitely. So eight seventy nine eighty Sixers finished fifty nine and twenty three. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see when, where did they get the Andrew Tony? And maybe you have that one. Did they get Tony no, before 1980? Nine, no, 1980. 1980, they got Tony. Okay. All right. So here they win 59 games. Key offseason additions. They got Clint Richardson, the guard, um, a guard by the name of Jim, Jim Sp- Spinarkle. Spinarkle. Jim Spinarkle, center Earl Curitan, who was a good backup. Uh, they traded Joe Bryant to the San Diego Clippers for the 1986 and first round pick, which, which was Brad Doherty. Shoot. Which unfortunately we screwed that up. So again, that was Roy Hinson. By these, by this, by this owner, this, these executives and these coaches, this organization was sound. And so, so then Katz came in his crew and they destroyed it in the long haul. Yeah, 
Yeah, seriously. So, so in the decade of the 80s, the Sixers played the Lakers three times in the finals. This particular year was the first time. And Sixers uh, played the Lakers. Unfortunately, they lost the series four games to two. Uh, this was Magic Johnson's rookie year. And this was the famous uh, game where Kareem got hurt in game five. Right. And uh, I got to imagine that the whole city of Philadelphia thought that this was going seven with, with Kareem out. Oh, yeah. I was, I, well, I was at game six. That's why okay. I, I thought for sure it was going to be. I thought for sure we were going to take game six. And if Kareem was going to be out, we were going to we, we had a shot at taking this out in Los Angeles. And then definitely. And, and, and Bob, what was your recollection from game six? Like watching Magic? Like, like I, I could I, I got to think that Magic Johnson's performance was like one of the greatest performances ever. And. In and finals it's, it's got to be one of the greatest performance in finals history the way i'm looking Plus, at it when you factor in he was a rookie yeah, yeah so, it's, like you yeah. said when jabbar was out you thought okay that's a done deal yeah so, the game was in philadelphia yeah, yeah so so on so unfortunately they lose that series that's the that's the lakers first championship of their five because the lakers lakers won five championships in the 80s in fact the lakers were in the finals eight out of the 10 years, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, the right. Showtime Lakers. Right. Yeah, well, back then, I mean, really, if you look at that, if you look at that whole, the 80s, the only, you look at the Western Conference. It was weak. It was weak. And that was usually San Antonio played the Lakers. The whole, the, was, the East was the toughest. We had Boston, you had Sixers, Milwaukee, you know? Right. Uh, when, and then later, it was Detroit, right? Detroit, Boston, in, in the late eight, in the late yeah. eight, the Knicks, Knicks with yeah. Patrick Ewing, yeah. The West, the West was West was weak, was weaker. not that difficult to dominate back then. Uh, yeah, like Mark said, you had San Antonio in the picture, uh, Houston, not so, not so much. Yeah, um, I mean Houston, the year Houston got into the final, eighty eighty one. The year that we probably what that we lost three games to Boston. They got in with a 40 and 42 record. I think it's the only team in NBA history that ever got to the finals with a below 500 record. I mean, it's amazing if you think about it. Phoenix was terrible. Uh, Seattle had they won. Warriors were bad. Seattle, a lot won, of Seattle won in 79, but yeah. by, they had by Jack Sigma and I forget who else they had. Yeah. Fred Brown. Yeah, the, the Warriors were bad. Uh, yeah, the, the Western Conference wasn't. Well, know. here, here, actually, it, it, you have right here. The Sixers actually got Tony during the eight before the eighty eighty one season. Yeah. So Andrew Andrew Tony was a key was the key off season of acquisition. Um, and and touching on what you said in eighty one, uh, <clears throat> they you know they had a three games to one lead versus Boston, which unfortunately they blew. But um, I'm looking in the semifinals because. One thing we got to recognize here is it seems like every year it was either it was Sixers, Milwaukee, Boston were the yeah. top three teams in the East. It looks like the East was a gauntlet because the Sixers beat Milwaukee in seven, which must have been a hell of a series. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at this Boston, I mean, this Milwaukee team, and you got Marcus Johnson, you got Bob Lanier, uh, Sidney Moncrief. I mean, that was Junior a hell of a team. Junior yeah. Bridgman. They were always... <laughs> Milwaukee back then always had more than 50 wins. That's how good they were. And and we had, that year, we had, what was it, 80-81, uh, we had 62 wins. And went, yet we were second in the Atlantic. Boston had more than we did. Yeah, <clears throat> Milwaukee was legitimately a good team. However, the same applies to them, in my opinion. Who were they playing? They were playing Cleveland, who was just dreadful. Uh -huh. They were playing... Uh, the Bulls sucked back then. Chicago, who were just Chicago was was just dreadful. Detroit was bad. Yeah, Detroit Indiana was dreadful. Yeah, that was their confidence. Indiana was maybe like the only competition that, that uh, to Milwaukee. Yeah. And again, I'm not taking any away from Milwaukee. They were they were a good team. All our playoff series were tooth and nail with them. Yeah, they were. That were, yeah, that's that's true, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it just shows you Milwaukee lost. Oscar Robertson, uh, Lou Alcindor, and I think even Bobby Dandridge, just to, 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 to your point, and they were still competitive even losing those three guys, those three Hall of Famers. So right. that goes they, to tell you about the competition they had. But, well, they had a they had a great they had a great front office, obviously, because they they replaced you know they replaced them with guys like you know Sidney Moncrief and all that. And, and they had Quinn Buckner. Yeah, Quinn Buckner. Yeah. 
Uh, they well, were I think they were. I think they were trying to make a trade, for Julius Serving for like Moncrief and a few of those guys, weren't they, Mark? Uh, and we turned it down. I don't remember that. In Julius's uh, uh, near Julius's end of his career, I think they wanted the name out there. We could have had a bunch of those guys. At the end of Doctor Chase, at the end of Doctor Chase career, I remember. Well, Detroit talk, too, but there was talk of trading him to the Clippers for uh, Tariq Cummings. Tariq, yeah, Tariq, Tariq Cummings. The guy Tariq named Cummings. Tariq Cummings, but yeah, I remember also, Tariq Cummings. They were never going to trade, which would have been the move. But they never noticed they would never trade a Dr. J. If he like tried to trade trade Bobby Clark back then, they were also or Bernie, he never would have done it. He was also fairly close to going to Utah, and uh, that was Harold Katz' influ influence with that. And this this was God. He, he this was maybe two years before he retired or so, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it flared up and it had some legs, and the city literally prevented that yeah from happening yeah um yeah when the rumors came out i mean people were pissed off they were like picketing outside of Katz's house he lived in huntington valley uh, yeah which is only five or ten minutes from, from here from from where we you know where we are and uh he had, he had a gated entrance to his house and there were literally people that would be there you know not many but a dozen yeah. or so people and they were picketing Havlik. nobody deserved it more Utah was was it was going to happen. Had there been sports radio back in the early '80s, because it didn't come till the late '80s when first it was Tom Brookshire, then it was Angelo, right? But if had there been sports radio back then, and they people mm -hmm. that people would have they were talking about trying to get rid of Dr. J, <laughs> tell me, like I said, they, like Rod said, there, there were people protesting at his, at Katz's house. Yeah. Instead of being like maybe 20, there would be hundreds. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm looking here. I mean, you know, like, 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 like you got, like, like I was always told, I mean, like grandpa always said the 81 season was like the biggest heartbreaker because I mean, you know, they, they, they have a three games to one lead against Boston against the Larry Bird led Celtics. And they lost three consecutive games by a total of five points. They lost game five at the Garden, 111 to 109. Game six at the Spectrum, 100 to 98. And then game seven at the Garden, 91 to 90. I mean, yeah. you know, this 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 series, because, I mean, because of Moses going to the finals with basically four guys, four other, four, four Jags, basically just another guy. Absolutely. You know, uh, whoever won this series was going to win the championship. And uh, this must have been the start of Andrew Toney, because Andrew Toney is only a rookie at this point. But he averages 19 points a game against the Celtics. This must have been the start of the Boston Strangler, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he had mm. prolific uh, regular season games against them, too. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, we, we probably would have played back then. Uh, we were playing Boston maybe nine times. Yeah, at least. Eight or nine times. I know it's – I think we only play them four game, mm. uh, four times in the season this if we, now because of the – league expansion and whatnot yeah but anyway he he uh and it was the boston press that came up with the nickname of the yeah of the and they actually Star. had a, they actually had a cover of sports illustrated where they show him with his doing his jumper and it and it said the boston strangler yeah they actually made the cover of sports illustrated do you remember yeah he had this real mm -hmm. peculiar jumper it came from like here yeah. It wasn't like up here. It was it came from there'd be times he'd be in the air and it would be like here. And it was just it was it wasn't all much different than it was almost like some kind of hybrid set shot. Yeah. Like it, it was it, what it reminded me of in some ways, it was like kind of like how Greer. How Greer used to have used to this when he took his shots, they seemed except, to, except he had perfect form. Oh yeah. Tony did not really necessarily have per perfect form. No. But he obviously yeah you know, when he was when he was on he was lights yeah, out nobody range stuck. yeah he did have a range I, I remember i mean i was i was too young to see him live but just from seeing the you know the series versus the lakers or whatever like he looked like for the for his size he had an, an, an a amazing ability to be able to shoot over big guys it looked it looked like he wasn't intimidated at all he like he could he could drive the lane hit that little quick quarter. release <laughs> yeah so, there the uh the picture I gave Dad. This series is this the same series where uh, Irvin and uh, Bird 
No, right. that, that was, happened in uh, – That was act- a preseason game. Yeah, that actually happened, I think it was like 1984 in the preseason. Yeah, that was okay. pre-season. a little bit after this one. Okay. Yeah, in fact, yeah, in fact, it's funny because Andrew Tony's known as the Boston Strangler, but, you know, you could have called Dr. J the, the Larry Bird Strangler there, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Bird got involved. And yeah. It was, it, was, uh, it, was, it, it was interesting. And, and, and of course uh, – in particular, because it was a preseason game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, so, uh, the thing about Tony too was he was strong. He, yeah, he, very strong upper body and overlooked. He was an underrated, to some degree, an underrated defensive player. He was a ter- he was just a terrific all around. I think Pat had a question: Who was underrated? We both answered Cheeks and Tony. Yeah, like there's your answer, Pat. Those two guys, most definitely. I mean, because when they brought Tony and he, like Roger said, he came from Alcorn State. What was that? You know, I think it's in Ohio, but. Well, you know, I'm, and and it's funny. where it is. It, well, it, it, and here's, here's another interesting aspect. So we get to the 81, 82 season and I'm looking at this record and the Sixers are 58 and 24, but it just go, but only second in the Atlantic. So it just goes to show you how, I mean, obviously we already knew this, but it just goes to show you how friggin' awesome those Boston Celtics teams were because you're winning 58 games and you're not even winning your division. Yeah. You know, I mean, think and, about and that. the year before mm-hmm. it was, uh, we won 62, 62 and 20 and we were still second. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like that's how, that's how unbelievably amazing. Like there's Latin bird, Mikhail Celtics that, teams were. And that's, that's a stretch where we've been given it year by year at, at that point mm-hmm. where we're at now, it goes back eight or nine years yeah of, of that length of time uh terrific terrific basketball and when and then you factor in that we were competing against uh the celtics who won world championships uh yeah. washington uh milwaukee milwaukee um, Good. great basketball back there. hey Boncara from duke just went number one by the way okay that's oh, wow. Safe, okay. That's a good safe pick for them. Uh, the kid from Duke went number one. You know what's ironic is Wojnowski said it was going to be the other kid, and Vegas said it was the kid from Duke. So, obviously, let's keep it real. Vegas usually knows because yeah, the yeah. kid from Duke was the betting favorite. Yeah. But anyway, all right. So, we get to the 81 82 season. Uh, Sixers, second place. They play Boston again. And once again, the Sixers get up three games to one. And they lose. Uh, they they lose game they lose game five and they lose game six, so they go to they, they go to Boston, and from what I remember, you know, from what I was told or whatever, uh, everybody just was marking it off. Oh my God, you guys choked! I think I think I think the in fact I think I think the the media was already saying that they choked, uh, and it really and it really lit a fire in the locker room. Both, both medias. Uh, Philadelphia and Boston had it written off, and Bill Fitch, who was the coach of the Celtics at the time, was quoted as saying, "When they asked him about Philadelphia mm-hmm. coming back to Boston, he's, he said they'll be so tight you won't be able to stick a pin up their ass." <laughs> and uh, I went to Game Six in Philadelphia and saw that loss, and it was it was a tough tough game, but you know we lost, and uh, I believe Game Seven was that Sunday. Yeah, it was a Sunday. I remember watching <laughs> and. Steve Fredericks was on the radio doing the game, and he always he was terrific. Yeah, mm-hmm. broadcasting those those games, and he he would make comments like uh, Andrew Tony, bang, and uh, he put he was really good to listen to. And uh, I remember when they won that game, we we drove down, we got the we, we called and we got the flight number, and we went down to be part of the the greeting. Yeah, of, of getting them back. Off, you know, when they came back from the uh, off the plane, uh, that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, I, I went from the low of Game Six to the high of Game Seven. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking at it here, so and that was the beat LA cheer in, in yeah. Boston. Well, yeah, that and that and I, you know, I always, I always, I mean, obviously, I hate the Celtics and you know, <coughs> Sixers and Celtics is like a great rivalry, but I always thought that was really cool. You know, that was because it it just the teams were so evenly matched. 
and such great rivals that it was like a really it was a really cool like respect thing where they they probably were like okay wow good you know hey it sucks we lost but good for you guys you right. guys really showed up a lot of balls you yeah, know what i mean they had a common enemy mm -hmm. yeah yeah because boston and la have always hated each other too so uh in game seven andrew tony had 30 points uh yeah and he had oh wow yeah here we go he had he had 30 in game two 39 in game four 34 in game seven and he's referred to as the boston strangler awesome. so so the sixers so the sixers make the finals again this year unfortunately unfortunately they lose to the lakers again in six um so you know unfortunately we couldn't get over that hump right so now we come into 19 and, that, and and another thing that season that we lost to the lakers for two that year <clears throat> lakers out rebounded us <clears throat> by six that's the end that whole game, you know, that game, six by six rebounds a game. And we, we had, go ahead. Martin. I was just going to say, and this was the impetus to bring in Malone <laughs> the following year. Yeah, we, was the, Malone, Malone was the, <coughs> he was the missing piece. Perennial rebounding champ in the league for a number of years. And they needed some guy that could just go up against Kareem and just get physical with it. That's what I was going to say. Even though Kareem was not a rebounder, we had no one that could stop him offensively. And, and it wasn't just us. Every, every you know, every other team in the league. But uh, we being being facing them two out of three two out of three years in the in the finals, uh, the light bulb went off, and the way to beat them was to get Malone. Yeah, and it worked. Okay, so here we enter the 82-83 season. This is one of the greatest teams in NBA history. Uh, 76ers finish 65-17. and 17. Uh, They have four NBA All-Stars, Dr. J, Malone, Cheeks, and Tony. The NBA MVP and the NBA Finals MVP is Moses Malone. Uh, Bobby Jones, this is, this, they were a great defensive team. Bobby Jones, Malone, and Cheeks were all, all NBA defensive first team. Uh, at this point, at this point, Dr. J really isn't the high flying scorer that he was back earlier in his career, especially against like the Trailblazers. Um, you know, this this was more of Malone's team, correct? Like Malone and and even Andrew Tony probably took on a bigger scoring role than, well, than uh, Doc. Offensively, yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they run they run every they run the offense more through, through Malone. I, I remember they had every game that they. Their first possession every game, they had a set play for Andrew Tony, and he would start on the right wing, and then flash mm -hmm. the baseline to get on the left side. Again, baseline shot, and ball was always in his hands. And I don't know what his, the shooting percentage was, but that that was their opening play every game, and he would it, it was almost like a little bit of a turnaround. 10 footer on the baseline from the left side and it was it was money but uh yeah they Irving didn't have to do so much because of the, the supporting cast yeah so I'm looking obviously the number one major acquisition was the Moses Malone they got him in a trade for Caldwell Jones and and, and a first round draft pick uh they acquired center Clemen Johnson from Indiana Pacers uh, they signed Mark I Ivoroni and small forward Reggie Johnson. Uh, they drafted Mark McNamara. He wasn't really a part of my, I mean, was he just a journeyman, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, so they were they were the main they were the main acquisition. So uh, we get to the 83 NBA playoffs. Uh, here's where Moses Malone, I have right here in the header, it says fo fo fo. Uh, it actually it actually became fo five fo, but that's all right though. Yeah. So the uh, the first round they swept the New York Knicks in four. Uh, Moses averaged 31 points, um, and then you got the Eastern Conference Finals. They beat the Milwaukee Bucks four games to one. That was the only loss loss they had in the playoffs. Right. Um, and then, of course, when they played the Lakers, they finally got their revenge on the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, the Sixers went out there and swept them four games to none. Yeah, and the, the Lakers had a really tough physical series against the Spurs to advance to the finals. That they had. A, we we coming off of four or five and they had a seven game series against the uh spurs that really you could you could tell they took it, took well, it well they also i mean not to 
obviously, I, I, I think, I think the Sixers were destined to win that no year question. anyway. But, no the, but, but James Worthy was hurt because they oh. James Worthy was were a rookie. They, I, I, wasn't James Worthy a rookie that year? I believe. Oh, uh, I'm pretty sure Worthy was hurt, oh, oh. and that was a big. That they, would have they been a big loss they, for them. They weren't 100, percent and it, like I said, in particular, coming off a, a real tough series against the Spurs when we were laying back and waiting for them. Uh, yeah, but regardless, it, yeah, that was the nobody team. Disputes. Sixers were a team with destiny. That they won 65 games in the year. Nobody disputes who was the best team in the league. Um, yeah, I mean, you look at the you look at the history of, of the NBA. The 67, 68 Sixers and the 82, 83 Sixers, arguably two of the best top ten teams in the history of the NBA ever. You have the uh, the Bulls at 170 games, the Warriors at 173 games, you know. Uh, I have a couple others, but oh, the Boston 86 team, mm -hmm. that was a fabulous team with Walton when he came off the bench. Uh, but this particular team is one of the greatest ever assembled. Mark so, Ivoroni, Mark Ivoroni was uh, starting, but Bobby Jones would come in as the sixth man. But uh, That's right. But yeah. if you look at their wins that year, uh, 65 wins, if, if they knew they had, they could have won a lot more than that. I remember watching like every game or listening to them on the radio. There was games that they just, they could have blown people out, but you know, they're resting players or just, you know, they were, they were so far ahead. Well, they, they if, had to... Go ahead. Like, if they knew, if they knew they needed like 72 wins for the, you know, the record best or whatever, what the, what's Golden State have now? I, I forget what Gold they State had. Was seven, Golden State 73. was 73 and nine. Oh. Right. So if, if they had a 73 and nine record ahead of them that year, they would have definitely got 74 wins is my point. They could have done it. It's hard to keep the pedal on the floor that time and some of those teams they were playing and how great they were. I mean, they just didn't need to win all those games. Well, the, the other thing, Bob, toward the end of the season, Malone came down with tendonitis in his knee and they sat him about five or six games. And uh, that's that's really what prevented them from really getting to, to over 70. Over 70. Uh, cause I, I was telling Mark earlier, I guess it would have been around – March, late March or early April, they were a cover on the uh, Sports Illustrated, and the, the heading was the Sixers go for 70. And okay. shortly thereafter, I guess it was this Sports Illustrated jinx or whatever. Right. Um, Malone, again, came down with tendonitis, and he, he rested mm -hmm. five, six, maybe even seven games uh, toward the end of the season, and, and rightfully so, because he, he turned out to be the MVP in the playoffs. But... Uh, yeah, so obviously, I mean, we finally we finally made good on the we owe you one promise. Doctor J finally got his ring. Um, you know, a, um, a lot of a lot of sport, just basically, just basketball fans from around the country. I mean, you know, we're just happy for Doctor J to finally get that title. You know, and 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 Phil, Philadelphia was the was the was the was the centerpiece of the NBA that year. Absolutely. You know, um, they, were, they were talking dynasty. They were talking dynasty then. Well, yeah, that's that's actually you know before before we get to before we wrap up here because you know I have a note like you know here, uh, you know because that team was so great, and then I'm looking at this 83 84 season and they they slipped down a little bit to 52 and 30, um, and they get you know they uh, they they were only 500 on the road. I think they were like 20 and 21 on the road. So you go from like this high. To like just being 500 on the road and 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 winning 13 games less than the previous year, I gotta think maybe there was a little bit of a championship hangover. You know, uh, think, maybe because they got over that home. I think injuries too. I think Tony sustained some injuries. The hangover was definitely there. Yeah. Uh, and to add insult, they lost to the Nets in the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right. And they lost all three at the Spectrum. Yeah. Which, yeah. which you would never. I mean, you know, so you know, so I, but 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 but. You know, you're still not ready to say the dynasty. There's still a chance for a dynasty there because, yeah, unfortunately they had the hiccup and they lost in round one. But then you go into the 84-85 season and you get Charles Barkley with the fifth pick. Future NBA Hall of Famer Charles Barkley added to this to this team, yeah. right? So the Sixers in 84-85, they finished 58-24. and 24. 
They make the Eastern Conference Finals again, but they, of course, they lose to a great Boston team four games to one. Well, this was Andrew Tony's last full season. Yeah. Right. And so this, uh-huh. so this was. This, I'm, I'm assuming that, with because uh, after this particular year, Dr. J was forced to play guard his last two years in the NBA. Correct. All right. So. Um, that must have been frustrating because here you're looking at a team that wins 58 games. If Andrew Tony doesn't get hurt, who knows what happens? But exactly. of course, but of course, the Celtics, the Celtics are right in the middle of their dynasty at this point. Yeah, you know. Well, yeah, what that really prohibited was Tony's, and I'm stating the obvious. Uh, you know, he was a player that you could have relied on to be your number one go-to right. offensive player, and uh, unfortunately. For him, his feet failed him. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and yeah. Cats. <clears throat> cats played a major. And cats mm-hmm. played a major role in that because cats was, cats was like, saying it was like if he wasn't saying it, he was in, he was intimating that he was a malingerer. Right. Like he was a guy mm-hmm. on workman's comp that wasn't hurt. You know, one of those types. When of he was hurt, he was not sitting on the bench. He was sitting in the stands. Mm-hmm. And that goes to, that was direct. That mm-hmm. was directive from. Oh, Yeah, you know, just well, and, well, and that and Andrew Tony. I mean, he, I don't think he's ever come back to the to the, the team. Has reached out to him to do certain things. He's never come back once, to, once or twice. Yeah, he, he doesn't come back. But, so um, then I'm looking at the now. This was when I first started watching basketball. 85, 86. Uh, they were 54 and 28. Um, this was the last season of Bobby Jones. Um, they they only made the semifinals that year. They lost in seven games to the Bucks. But this is where Moses Malone. Moses, well, I was actually at the game. It was the first game I was ever Marcus, at. Marcus Orbit. First game I was ever at. It was Good Friday in 1986. I won uh, I won tickets for the um, father-son night. So Grandpa took me down to the game. And uh, Moses got poked in the eye. And, right. and yeah. from that moment on, he wore goggles in his career. Yeah, right. But that was Moses' last game as a sixer. It was also Bobby Jones' last season as a sixer. You lost Tony at this point, so basically, and Dr. J's at the end. Of Do- the Dr. J is enter yeah, because Dr. J was going to play his last year in eighty six, eighty seven. But this is at this point, it's clearly Barkley's team, right? You know, so Bar- Barkley, um, from what I remember, Barkley carried them to a first round win, I believe, against the Bullets. I think Barkley was like he had like a game winning, sh- couple game winning shots or something like that, and um, you know, unfortunately. This 85 86 team was still good, 54 wins, but then they screwed up the dynasty in the 86 draft. The 86 draft was where they screwed, Harold Katz screwed everything up. Like making the trade. He trades Darby <clears throat> to Cleveland. You got, you got Jeff Rowland. He couldn't he could late last. And Roy Hinson. Roy Hinson only had good games against us. So they thought, oh, let's get this guy. So they go to Darby, he goes to Cleveland, and he becomes an all all star for like what eight years in a row. Mm. And then he trades Malone to Washington, and they bring in Jeff Ruland, and he plays five games, and then that's it. His yeah. career's over. And they got uh, and they got the name of Cliff Robinson. They got a guy named Cliff Robinson who was doing cocaine, and uh, but anyway, yeah. Malone had three more all star seasons after we traded him. Yeah. Imagine with, him with Brad Doherty and Barkley, because Brad exactly. Doherty probably Brad Doherty probably would have played power forward or forward for us, right? We have Barkley, Brad Doherty, and uh, Moses Malone, right? Yeah, we would have had Malone. We could have Doherty and Barkley. That would have been in your front court, you know? Yeah, yeah but um, seriously, yeah, it's on. Cheeks was still playing. I'll, I'll be honest with you. When, when that trade happened, <clears throat> if Ruland had have been perfectly healthy i had no problem with it because ruin was ruin was a stud yeah he could rebound uh, great pass and well, he, he was about six seven years younger he was well, about from 26, what, 27 years old well i was going to say from from what i remember the reasoning of the trade was that was because of Ruland's outlet passing because barkley was such a great athlete they wanted Ruland to be able to throw the outlet pass to barkley yeah. and barkley could run down the court as much as Ruland was as like a joker kind of passer Ruland could pass like the, the joker right now in fact the, like, the, the the couple games he played for us i mean he really looked good until you know yeah. he only lasted five games though yeah he, we had they came out the block they came out of the gun they just added a Block five and zero, oh, and then all of a sudden he was done. He was similar to like Willis Reed on the outlet passes. Mm-hmm. 
when Willis I got a story about that. A good friend of mine I used to work with, with when I was uh, in World Trade Center. Her husband was just out of medical school and he was the Sixers team doctor back then. Mm. And so when they came to evaluate Ruland, he looked at Ruland and he told Katz personally, mm. he said, whatever you do, do not trade for this guy. Mm. This guy's knee is it's bone on bone. It's bone on bone. It's, mm -hmm. Just don't do it. He did it anyway. So my 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 friend's uh, husband quit. She said, mm -hmm. I can't work for a guy like this. She's not going to take my advice. You know, I, was gonna, I, I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you. Did you know, they do a medical on him? Yeah, he was, he was the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. yeah. What were you going to say, Bob? No, I was going to just say, what did, wouldn't they have done a good medical on him? It sounds like they did, but Kat screwed that up. Yeah, it's just, it's just a shame because, again, you know, obviously I want to, you know, I mean, I'm very thankful for the championship in 83. You know, I mean, obviously the 83 team was one of the greatest teams of all time. So, you know, I don't want to be, uh, quote unquote, pissing in the Cheerios here because I, I am, you know, I want to, I'd like to celebrate that championship, but I can't, I can't help but be maybe just a little bit down in the fact that that team in that era was so good. I mean, all those, all those 50 plus win seasons. And then you stop and look at, you get a hall of famer, like a Charles Barkley to add on to these guys. And, you know, between bad management decisions and unluck like with Andrew Tony getting hurt. I mean, this, this team really could have been set up for great success it, and, and they just, and they just, there was, they pissed it away. There was a major transition obviously after 83. Because uh, yeah, Cunningham retired. Mm -hmm. Jack McMahon passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fabric of the team changed. Pat Williams went to Orlando. Like they couldn't stand mm -hmm. cats. Yeah, that's yeah. what it was. Everybody hated cats. That's why they all got out. Pat Williams went to Orlando. He and did. He, he did bring him. in. He, yeah, he yeah. did bring in Moses. So I don't think we would have Moses. So if we didn't have cats, right? The cats. Well, he did. Yeah, but yeah, cats, he, cats that's just probably had the got, money to buy. Well, I was gonna say. That probably got to his head because they couldn't get over the hump. It was Cat com it was Cats comes in and, and buys the team. He he he, he buys gets Moses. Home. They win, and then they you know, he thinks he knows basketball. Right. I mean, there's yeah. a there's a there's a, there's a story in the later Sean, 80s. Sean Bradley. Yeah, there's a story uh, in the later 80s when this when they uh, he had Charles Shackelford come over to his house and gave him a tryout in his driveway, and. Uh, what he called there was a uh, there was a what he called there was a, a big argument in the locker room back this was when barkley was playing with uh Char armin gilliam he called him Charmin. yeah and he oh, called yeah. him shackleford and uh barkley's talked about this on a mike missinelli one time and he said he said shackleford always went out and he got he started the, every game but he got two fouls so quickly then i had to pick him off the floor and he said to him, why the hell is you always getting two fouls early all the time? He said, so the people will stop booing me. Yeah. And yeah. He, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Barkley commented the one time he goes, I asked for Shaq. They gave him, they gave me Shaq I mean, he, he's, he's, he's famous for one. He's famous for one thing that that dunk he made for uh, North Carolina State right. with Valvano. That's it. Yeah. Otherwise, he did nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, but, uh, it was a. Harold. Harold Katz, like I said, that nobody can tell me that they it just got to the point with each one of those individuals in the, in the management, let alone the players who uh, they they just couldn't tolerate working for him. Yeah. Well, you know what though? Hey, let's give them credit for one thing. They did they did win in '83, and they had you know like we said we we did we, this was this was uh this show was called. Uh, from worst to first, the uh, the ten year the ten year odyssey, right? Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. you know we went a little over the ten years, but um, you know they bottom line is from 72, 73, they won nine games. They became an unbelievably successful franchise, and you know they brought in you know they brought in a guy who helped save the NBA because Dr. J, along with Magic and Bird, probably saved the NBA. Right. And then of course then when Michael Jordan came in, he elevated it to a whole other stratosphere, but. It started with, but with it started with Dr. J and Magic oh. and Bird. So, you know what we and 
no matter what, maybe, you know, we could sit here and, and I could sit here and argue and, and say like, oh, it would have been nice to win a couple, but hey, they did get one. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, so we're going to get ready to wrap up here. And, uh, you know, I hope everybody enjoyed this walk down memory lane. Um, you know, we got an NBA draft tonight. So, uh, you know, Sixers probably won't be picking probably till maybe about 10 o'clock. Or if they do pick, I'm kind of hoping they don't pick. I hope they get somebody. But um, I hope you every, hope everybody enjoyed this walk down memory lane. And uh, we'll be back. Uh, my brother, the Colonel, is going mm -hmm. back to visit our the land of our ancestors, Ireland. And when he returns next month, what is that? Just when are you coming back? Uh, like the 11th, I think. All right, probably like the second after you come back, a few days after you're back, we'll five days or so we'll put together another show and i don't know what the topic's going to be yet but we'll uh we'll take you down memory lane again another uh philly sports history uh the old school yeah i hope you enjoy i hope you enjoyed it have a great night everybody go sixers go sixers, go sixers. Uh